Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us. I'm Soraya Field Fiorio, the director of the education program here at Lapham's Quarterly. We're pleased to host the event this afternoon in collaboration with our sponsors, the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs, who underwrites our public programs, and the Alumbra Innovations Foundation, whose generosity enables us to support K through 12 and community college educators across the country. The discussion will take place between Curtis White and the Quarterly's founder, Louis Lapham. The theme follows the publication of our most recent issue on freedom. In Curtis White's preamble, It's Not About You, he writes, this issue of Lapham's Quarterly bravely addresses the hotly contested word freedom. It is hotly contested in part because what the word means has never been clear, a fact that has not seemed to lessen its importance for us. And yet freedom cannot be dismissed simply on semantic grounds as just another word because what is at its heart may very well answer the question, what does it mean to be human? Curtis White is a novelist and social critic whose latest book is Transcendent, Art and Dharma in a Time of Collapse, published by Melville House. He was a distinguished professor of English at Illinois State University until his retirement, and his essays have appeared in Harper's Magazine, Orion, and The Village Voice. Lewis Lapham founded The Quarterly in 2007. He is the author of 14 books and was the editor at Harper's Magazine from 1976 to 1981, and again from 1983 to 2006. The discussion this afternoon will run about an hour and will be recorded. We'll save time at the end for Q&A. If you have questions for Lewis and Curtis, please submit them to the Q&A module, which you can find by clicking the icon with two speech bubbles. Only questions submitted in the Q&A module will be admitted for, di for discussion. Lewis and Curtis, I'll hand the conversation over to you. Curtis, it's a joy to see you again, right? Great Even though it's you, buddy. <laughs> and I think this is a wonderful issue of the magazine and I agree with you. I mean, it's a word that lots of people fumble around with, but it's hard to know what they mean by it and what this issue does and what you do in your preamble opening essay is to raise the question, what is freedom? Where is it to be found? What does it mean to be free? I mean, my observation over the years is that most people don't want to be free. It's, it's, a, it's a fairly frightening uh, state of mind. But go ahead and tell us how you uh, perceive the word freedom. What do you think it means and, and why do you open your essay with a discussion of George Carlin. Mm -hmm. Who was Carlin? What, and why was he called the dark bard of unfreedom? What is unfreedom? Yeah. Uh, as, for the, as for the word freedom, uh, I, I'm reminded of something that uh, St. Augustine said in relationship to the word uh, time. And he said, I know what it is until I think about it. And uh, I think that um, a lot, uh, most people use the word and I think necessarily in a purely heuristic or pragmatic way uh, without, but I think it is also important to, um, and, and that's very important, right? In, in a contextual sense, to use the word freedom is to set for yourself uh, a kind of shared position in, in relationship to, to others in your community, basically. You know, if you're, if you're a slave, you make commonality among other slaves or in people who are sympathetic with you uh, through the invocation, and then that's perhaps a good word for it, and the invocation of the idea of freedom. Now, what that idea uh, means in itself is another matter. And, you know, Augustine, in thinking about time, goes to great detail to sort of say, you know, what is it? And I, I like, you know, having a sort of philosophical bent of mind, 
I, I like to think about, well, I understand the pragmatics, the contextual importance of using of the word freedom, but I'm also interested in, in uh, sort of the more metaphysical aspect of it. What is it that uh, what is it that we invoke when we invoke the idea of freedom? Is there a kind of uh, a way of thinking about it that gives it a, a kind of metaphysical uh, specificity? As for Carlin, uh, you know. <laughs> Oh, the the honest truth truth of uh, why I uh, used Carlin. I mean, it's a funny thing. After you know, fifty years of of writing, you get to this sort of odd point where what you need comes to you. That's actually a quote from James Joyce. He was, you know, he was asked. Uh, I think it was in a conversation with Beckett. Uh, you know, uh, what he does to find material or prepare what he's writing, and he said, "I don't." I don't bother with uh, that at all. What I need will come to me. It was his conclusion. And uh, in some ways, you know, I mean, I got, I can't remember if it was you telephoning me or if it was Kelly Burdick sending me an email, but you know, it was sort of out of the blue, right? We want you to write an essay about, about freedom. And I go, oh, great. Um, but I had recently watched uh, the, the uh, Carlin, I guess it was an HBO special uh, on George Carlin's American freedom. Um, and uh, it just the whole the whole essay just kind of fell into my lap very suddenly. I I, I really have come to think that uh, the idea of ha of, of uh, for writers of having a muse is not as ridiculous as it as it sounds at first. So Carlin kind of, it kind of fell into my lap. Frankly, early on uh, in his career, I didn't think much of him. Uh, I thought he was he reduced uh, the counterculture to uh, some fairly cartoonish um, characters, as with the hippy dippy weatherman, et cetera. But I the, mean, for those of our viewers who don't know, I mean, Carlin was a stand up comedian in the 60s. Yeah. Right? Okay. Yeah. Famous for his uh, free flowing attacks yeah. on the conventional wisdom. Yeah. At any rate, you know, I had the I had the idea for the essay all sort of mapped out in my brain practically within 24 hours, and so you know I don't know where the where it all comes from, but it seemed to work. Well, I mean, you you ask most ask almost any American what is freedom and where does freedom lie, and and they will point in the direction nine times in ten, they will point in the direction of money. Freedom, uh, our society is one that is dominated by the rule of money. And the uh, you're entitled in our society to as much freedom as you can afford. Right. <laughs> it's, uh, and that gets to be, in my lifetime, uh, gets to be more and more expensive. And there are fewer and fewer people who can afford yeah. the price of freedom in, in our yeah. society. Yeah, the uh, Italian Marxist philosopher Antonio Negri had a great phrase for what you're describing, which was the sociality of money. And he says, and another thing he said was that money always wears the face of the boss. So it's a kind of, you know, I talk about the prison house of money. In the in the essay and elsewhere in the book, um, so yeah, I mean, you I, you you also quote the uh, Huron Indian, the Huron chief, right? Uh, right. Can, Candelonk, right? Who, who this is the early. 18th century in America, mm -hmm. and he says that the uh, he's talking about the French, uh, the way they live. He's been to Paris. To pretend you can live in the country of money and at the same time save one's soul is as great a contradiction as for a man to go to the bottom of a lake to preserve his life. Right. I mean, this is a magnificent 
noble savage, <laughs> very articulate. But we we do live in a society, as you've said in many of your books, including in the new one, uh, when you're talking about transcendence and dharma. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, we live in a world that's ruled by, ruled by money. Mm -hmm. I mean, we trade our freedom to speak, freedom to think, for the freedom to shop. Right. <laughs> right. And, uh, you know, any uh, any book writer in this culture knows that there's something that, that money expects something from him. Money expects him to write in a certain way and to think in a certain way. <laughs> So if you want to if you want to publish with a commercial publisher, you've got to get past a, a number of gatekeepers. The first of which is your own agent, who right. looks at it and sort of says, "I can't sell this." Right. Well, you know, is it a good book or a bad book? Is it, you're excited about it or not? Well, I can't sell it, so it doesn't matter how I feel about it. Right. And, um, and then the uh, the the next level is, of course. Uh, the editor who hardly has to do anything because the agents are so efficient at making sure no one <laughs> doing anything different gets to the editor. But at that level, you know, my own, I've had experiences of this kind where the, uh, the editor at a commercial press <coughs> said basically, uh, uh, well, we can publish this book if your bottom line is this. And I was told your bottom line needs to be liberalism has a chance of saving the world. Uh, you know, bourgeois democracy essentially, he was saying, has has a, has a way of saving the world. And I said, you know, I said, are you kidding? That's not what I think. Did you read the manuscript? Yeah. <laughs> and so I said, you know, it was pretty clear he was offering me a lot of money if I would say that. <laughs> I. I no publishers. I didn't, say I didn't. I didn't, I didn't <laughs> yeah. take the money. Didn't take the money right. and run. But why is it that so many people really don't want to be free? It's free, scary. Uh, it's scary. It's scary. It's terrifying yeah. because yeah, I, I think I mentioned in the, in the essay that uh, there's a kind of domestic terrorism going on culturally, which is uh, homelessness. So people people think that you know if they don't study what they're supposed to study, uh, if they don't get the kind of job that uh, is offered to them in high tech, especially these days, um, that you know life gets scary at this point. If you know you're trying to to find something uh, that is really your calling in some sense, right? Um, it's on the front pages of the newspaper every day. More and more and more homeless people, more and more displaced people. That is not only a problem, but it's also a form of a, th it's a kind of threat because anybody can be there, it's telling you, es especially if you don't already have a trust fund or a lot of money in a bank account, then you can just ignore the whole damn thing. Yeah, but I mean, our education system is set up to get, help people get a job, right? I mean, right. Yeah, people don't go to college to discover the freedom of mind. Right. They go to college to uh, find out, I mean, to put themselves in a position uh, to buy all the toys in the American department store. Yeah, but also to be safe, you know? To I be mean, safe, they, yeah. They want to feel, they want to feel safe. I mean, yeah. they end up buying all the toys. In the, don't get me wrong, because being safe is not necessarily, in the long run, a fulfilling thing. So you know, they try to fill yeah. their lives with the wrong things, and that's consumerism. In fact, there was just a there was just an Amazon van uh, in front of uh, my house the other day, and their new thing is happiness may be inside. You know, <laughs> I'm going, wow. Yeah. <laughs> that's a, that's a throwback to naked consumerism. Yeah, you'll be happy if you get packages delivered to your house. Right. Okay. But none of it. At one point, you you say, 
to be born into a racist, sexist, evangelical, gun crazy, truck driving community makes it likely that you will, to some degree, be racist, sexist, evangelical. And so, so what do we learn growing up? I mean, what is taught to us? Yeah. Well, uh, that um, what I was trying to talk about there was what Buddhism calls karma, the condition, the causes and conditions into which into which we're all born and that we have no control over, you know, uh, and that those causes and conditions uh, tend to say model yourself after what you see or or suffer the consequences, beginning with uh, rejection by your own family. But um, there are times, and certainly the counterculture in the 60s was one of those times when people are given uh, uh, enough reason to examine what all that means that they begin to question their position within it. And a lot of people who are artists by nature will, will certainly do that. But in the 60s, it was really Vietnam because you had a gun pointed to your head. And so, uh, and the draft. So, yeah. Caused a lot of people to 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 reconsider, uh, you know, their participation in a in a culture that, frankly, you and I know, uh, seemed determined to kill us. You know, <laughs> it certainly was yeah. no secret to me. Yes, right. I mean, but that in turn goes back to the ancient argument between rich and poor. Right. The rich, the the rich are always trying to get rid of the poor, right? I mean, <laughs> well, I mean if, they, if they don't have a good use for them, like uh, you know the uh, Roman troops, uh, yeah, have a good use for them, then yeah, get rid of them. And I say that's very much the case right now. I mean, I don't think that the oligarchs have have uh, even the beginning of some sort of sense of conscience about how many people are going to have to die all over the world in the course of the next two decades or three decades, be mostly because of climate change. But be climate change is going to drive all kinds of stuff, military confrontation, food shortages, all of that. And so actually, uh, Putin has, uh, uh, has endorsed a kind of conspiracy theory that says that the, uh, the oligarchs actually, he should speak, uh, the oligarchs actually want to get the world population down to the the golden 100 or 100, the golden the golden uh, billion the golden billion people um, right yeah actually I, actually I think uh, there's a certain kind of truth in that even though it's an it is a conspiracy theory and uh, it's an unpleasant one too but I think there's some truth in that I don't think that the the rich give a damn if a billion people have to die somewhere else, as long as they're out of sight. Oh, I, I think that's absolutely true. I mean, that's that's been my observation of the rich over the many years. I wrote a book in 1989 called Money and Class in America and found that to be the indifference to the other people's death was uh, fundamental to the American rich, and, but that's again that that one of the great lessons of the twentieth century is that we can murder people, yet uh, levels of industrial uh, numbers. I mean, that's the one of the reasons that Britain got into World War I was to, to get rid of rebellious people in Ireland and England that were on the verge of civil war. Right. I mean, the, the massacre of, of, of the uh, working class uh, in World War I was spectacular. Same thing true of... of in an industrialization of murder. I mean, that, that, that's Hitler. Right. Mao, Paul, Paul, Paul Pot. Right. I mean, 
I mean, one thing we've learned in in the in the twentieth uh, century is to get rid of people in 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 uh, large numbers. If you don't need them, you know. I mean, uh, traditional. I mean, in terms of Marxist theory, uh, capitalism has always needed a surplus population so that so that they wouldn't be threatened by things like strikes. So if your workers go on strike, that's fine. They, we have this surplus impoverished population that we can bring in and, and take their place. So capitalism, according to Marxist theory, uh, always needed that. They're trying to get rid of that, even that need now through automation. Right, yeah. And well, So, you, you know, I mean, what are the two things that reduce profit uh, for, for corporations? Principally, one, one of them is simply the cost of labor. So if they're going to yeah. compete, if they're going to compete with other, uh, you know, industries or the, you know, within their own industry, um, they they need to find ways of being by selling something cheaper than their competitor, and one way of doing that is by keeping the, the lid on on wages, which, you know, obviously Starbucks is hip to that, right? Because Starbucks knows there's there's no shortage of other coffee houses where people could go, so they have so they want to they, they want to make that difference as small as possible, uh, basically on the backs of their workers. The other way of doing it is to drive uh, workers into the prison of debt. Right. That's that's the that's another way of of. Uh, uh, eliminating yeah yeah and i talk about student debt quite a bit in some detail in the essay and in the book because it's such a scandal you know when i when i uh went to university of san francisco and starting in 1969 uh i was offered scholarships at any number of, of places i could go wherever i wanted within the state of california and not have to pay a dime and you know, if I didn't have that situation, uh, there were always the state, always the state co colleges, which charged like four hundred dollars a semester or something, three hundred dollars a semester to go to a Cal State campus, and they were good. They were good schools, uh, but now uh, it's like um, you know, the debt part of it is a form of social coercion. So they want you to go into debt. They, yeah. don't want, they don't want the state to pay for uh, basics like health and education and housing. They want you to go into debt in order to do it because that gives them control over you. Right. I mean, that, that same thing with credit card debt. Yeah. Or, or mortgage debt. I mean, but it, it does. It it puts you in the state of unfreedom. Right. Exactly. Right. Mm hmm. Do you see any way around this? Uh, I mean, the uh, uh, right pe people have written about this, you know, for thousands of years. And, and the but a man named Jameson once said, "It's easier to imagine the end of the world than it is to imagine the end of capitalism." <laughs> I'm afraid that's true. I think it is. So, so yeah, I mean, to me, you've got two options. You've got the socialist revolution option. Good luck with that. I I don't believe in the, in the possibility no. of a socialist revolution. I think that uh, you know capitalist realism uh, is here until it until it destroys itself, which it's very likely to do. Um, my option has always been, but you know, I was a child of the '60s. So my option was it was it, what saved me from Vietnam was the counterculture. I was in the Bay Area and lived in San Francisco. Uh, it, what was very clear to me is that oh, these people are alive. They're playful. They're a little addled at times, sure, uh, but they don't want me to go to Vietnam. That's thumbs up for me. Um, so you know, it, to me that uh, that's that spirit of community that just sort of says, we're gonna operate outside of that system. 
we're going to have different values and, and, and we're going to create different meanings. That is a large part of my attraction to Buddhism because it, it presents itself as a system of alternative values and meanings which are quite compatible, as the counterculture made clear, quite compatible with uh, the Western countercultural spirit and the Western art spirit. Um, and uh, so the, the, uh, Buddhism calls that alternative community the Sangha. And basically what it says is, is you know, join, join each other, create, create alternative spaces, create alternative ways of feeding yourself. And, um, I, you know, the degree to which that's, I think it's going to be more important to think in that way as the years progress because we're gonna be in a situation, I think, where we'll, we'll have nothing else, uh, no other potential for support. So we're gonna, in, I, so I make a prediction, I would say that in the course of the next half century, if we've prepared uh, for that eventuality, uh, we're going to be creating our own communities, feeding ourselves, et cetera. And we'll have, you know, maybe like we did in the counterculture days, there'd be, uh, places that, that you could trust to be on the same page with you, like Santa Fe to Madison to wherever, you know. Yeah. I, 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 I agree with you. I mean, it, it's the, uh, it's a workable, well, but, but that also involves acquiring or being obliged to acquire a, a tragic sense of life, which the Americans are not at easy with. I mean, the American doctrine yeah. of exceptionalism is that Americans deserve to live forever. Yeah, well, you know, basically that's what Buddhism says is that uh, you, you live in what they call samsara, you know, the, you live in the the eternal cycling of habit, mostly yeah. bad habits, mostly destructive habits, based upon uh, uh, the the three poisons: anger, greed, and delusion. This, but for me, especially delusion. The thing that really identifies American culture is the degree of its delusion. Yeah. So. Um, G give yeah, me a I mean, uh, that's kind of fatalistic, but at the same time, Buddhism offers joy. It sort of says, you know, once you get beyond the delusions and and um, and uh, you know become a awake to what what's real, um, you have you gain a certain kind of freedom, and that's part of what I was trying to get at through Carlin in the essay. Can you give us? A a couple of examples of the delusions that you uh, find noticeable? Yeah. Uh, well, the big one for Buddhism, and uh, it's not an unfamiliar one for the, for the West at all, is ego. The idea that you have a self, that you have a, uh, a self-sustaining, self-existing self. Yeah. And, and uh, for, for Buddhism, uh, what that self starts to do that produces bad karma and and suffering is it starts to want things. You know, the self stands in its nakedness before the world and then and starts to say, uh, I'm empty. So bring the Amazon truck, you know, <laughs> bring yeah. whatever. I need to, you know, I, I, uh, or, or sex or food or whatever the pleasures. Bring me pleasure, mostly is what it says because it has nothing deeper to imagine. Aristotle talks, I'm, I'm not sure I get the quote exactly right, but he talks about what happens in Athens where the aristocratic democracy of Athens and Pericles deteriorates into a plutocracy mm. and the uh, 
Aristotle calls plutocracy is what we have in the US, US at the moment. And the, and the uh, Aristotle defines it as government by government so lost in the dream of riches mm -hmm. as to imagine that there is nothing that money cannot buy. Right. And he, he called those kinds of people he called prosperous fools. Beginning with uh, freedom. <laughs> yeah, that's right. You know, Petronius is a uh, Petronius is Trimalcio's feast. Well, Trimalcio is this wonderfully rich Roman uh, who is throwing this extravagant banquet uh, in honor of his own birthday, but he was a slave. That was his origin. He was a slave. And uh, sort of that, uh, uh, that, that movement to, into wealth produced only the most unbelievable sort of destruction and vulgarity. I mean, Petronius, people read, need, need to read Petronius, the, the Satyricon, or at least see Fellini's version of it on, in a movie. Yeah, and, and the Greeks also had the word for it called pleonixia, which was the desire for more. Mm. More, more of everything. More dancing girls, more food, more wine, more naval victories. Right more portrait busts and so on. And, and that is the character of, of, of Trump. Yeah. Well, it's like Agamemnon coming back from the Trojan Wars and, and sort of landing home and getting off the boat and saying, and announcing the, the, the glories of having won. And, and he says, war, may it never fail me. Right. Oh. <laughs> So, yeah. But war is always a Pyrrhic victory. There are no, there are no winners in war. No. I mean, Trump says winning is everything. It's ridiculous. Yeah. I mean, it's a very, uh, Agamemnon would know exactly what Trump meant. <laughs> yes, I, I know he would. <laughs> oh, God. I mean, the, uh, I think we have no choice but to uh, severely modify uh, our idea of capitalism. Yeah. You know, capitalism is not an idea. It's not an ideal. It's, it's, a, it's simply a, me a, me a mechanical function. Right. And it's based upon competition rather than cooperation. Yeah. Which means that even if a capitalist wanted to change the way that capitalism functions, he couldn't. Right. I use he because it's mostly deserved. Um, he couldn't because he would put himself at a con competitive disadvantage. Right. So you know, I mean, if, if a, a CEO says, "Well, I want to do less damage to the environment, uh, but that's going to cost money," then he's he's creating oh, he's creating overhead for himself and making himself. Uh, uh, less competitive. That's that's that mean. That's what economists call a negative externality. You know, you're polluting this this river, but you're not having to pay for it. Right. right. So if you start to take take responsibility for cleaning up that river, then you're adding to your to your right. overhead and putting yourself at a comparative disadvantage. That's why, in some ways, monopolies uh, are are at least hold the potential. <laughs> of being something different than that. Because when you have no competition, then maybe somebody uh, upstairs will, will get the idea that, oh, oh by the way, we're, we've been destroying our own world for the last 200 years. Yes, and that's also why monarchy is not a bad way of governing. Yes, yeah, some people say that. I, I, I punt on that one. <laughs> Hey, Louis, okay. I wanted to talk to you about something that is a little more cheerful, which is that, you know, um, and I'll start with, I think you and I have a, a lot in common as writers. And uh, um, I'll start with my own you know, the new book, The trans, uh, Transcend Transcendent, um, and say that, you know, 
one of the ways in which it uh, it works and uh, for people who like the book is that it's so unconventional. It's play, it's playful. It's uh, yeah. imaginative. In other words, it makes an argument in a way that really the commercial presses don't like because it's not linear. It's not making one argument and it's not written in a kind of journalist. So there's humor, there's play, there's satire, uh, and there's invention. Yeah, your essay in the current issue is a very good one too, and it reminded me of of how much that's been your strategy as well, because your your work is very voice driven. It's very yeah. voice driven, and it's and it's always it's uh, inventive in the way that it makes its points. It's and in that sense, it's it's playful if <laughs> a little harsh at times, but who isn't? Uh, yeah. So I I, I wonder. I wonder why, uh, because there are many people who write like us. No, they're not. And uh, and I wonder why we write like us. Is it the is it the was it the, uh, for me? I know the, the first time I read an essay, which was in high school, I read uh, uh, Norman Mailer's advertisements for myself. Um, right. You know, think what you like about Norman Mailer. He was a huge, uh, hugely important for me, because the you know. It, basically, those essays said, there's no limits. You know, do what you will <laughs> within yeah. this form. Now, I was wondering, uh, so I was wondering, wh what do you think? But why are we, why do we write like this? Why doesn't anybody else write like this? Well, because we're not trying to impress anybody. I mean, we're not trying to swing an election or get ourselves appointed Secretary of State. I mean, most of the pundits in Washington are uh, are they, career moves. Mm -hmm. they, they they can't afford to be uh, playful, right? Because that must that might be a black mark, right? You know, and and they're trying to they're trying to climb a, a kind of ladder i mean yeah you know i mean their objective is to uh be an expert be a wise man be i mean be, be somebody who's paid and paid well uh, to deliver uh, the necessary sophisms to the ruling class right Right. I read an essay recently in Salon called uh, uh, Buddhism's Cult of Expertise. Because now it's gotten to the point where if you want to know about Buddhism in America, you have to go to, to the experts, usually people who have one foot in the sciences, especially neuroscience. But, uh, but you know, uh, you know, I, I, I studied, I graduated from Yale in 1950 six and i got interested in buddhism and when i was at yale and, and took courses in it in the graduate school right i mean i was allowed to audit them mm -hmm. and and then uh i'm in san francisco and my first job as a newspaper reporter in 1957 and i got to know alan watts ah. and read alan you know not only reading him, but but uh, also meeting him. So that's how I wandered into the idea of Buddhism. Yeah, that would have been even before the Zen Center. Yeah. Yeah. But you know what I think is that, uh, you know, we were sort of talking in, in very gloomy terms at, at, at the, for, for the first half hour or so of our conversation here, but I, I thought I would propose the idea that um, the style in which you write is its own kind of uh, offering of joy. Yeah. Because it offers, you know, and really the style in which you write offers an alternative reality to the reality that people uh, are, are, are obliged to live through. And I'd like to, I'd like to think that I, uh, my work does much the same thing. It does. Yeah. That's the that's the way I think we get around uh, 
capitalism. I do. I mean, I, I think it goes in that direction yeah. or that kind of a direction because that, that gives people the freedom to live. They, they, they don't have to have the, you know, the big house, the big title, the, whatever, you know. Right. Yeah, for me back in the in in the sixties when I declared a major, because it was so cheap, I didn't have to go into debt. I could study anything. And I basically said, I'm going to become an English major as a way of turning my back on the world. Right. I don't care if I'm poor. I was already poor. I don't right. care if I'm poor. I want to study this because I think it has something to tell me about how to live. But, yeah. But who can afford to do that now? That's that's where we're at. That's, I mean, the, uh, I mean, one of the purposes of founding this quarterly magazine was to be able to make that kind of uh, thinking and writing available to people. And, you know, the elite universities give a course in the humanities. Uh, but it's sixty thousand dollars a year, right? And, and the, uh, and then you don't really end up. You end up with the standard cliche, and and the quarterly gives you uh, the original voices, right? For six sixty dollars a year, and we and we give it free to prisons and and uh, uh, community colleges. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, no, I I. I think your readers deeply appreciate your love of uh, the humanities and the love of thought, the love of art. Yeah. And, um, you know, we're with you. Well, I'm with you too, Curtis. <laughs> I, I, I love your books, as you well we're know. But, we're buddies. Yeah, right. Okay. How, how, where are we for time? We have 15 minutes left. We've got a couple questions coming in from, from the audience. One, so lots of people are commenting that we started um, the conversation about freedom and went directly basically into the conversation about debt and, and uh, money. In a way this ties into Curtis's book or his, his preamble, you talk about Buddhism as being incompatible with the Western mindset that is so empirical, that is so um, works within a positivist framework that's really centered on data. And really money or the concept of money is uh, such um, an example of this. Um, even the fact that, as you just said in the conversation, that we want a neuroscientist to validate the positive effects of, of Buddhism. Could you speak a little bit more how Buddhism, which is really incompatible with the West, might work within a Western framework, even if not so much as its own spiritual system as like what you write about is secular Buddhism or this other way of conceptualizing freedom that isn't uh, bound to this idea of, of money or debt? Right. Uh, I, I don't think that Buddhism is incompatible in, in the West at all. <clears throat> I don't even mind that the neuroscience might take an interest in it. What I what I have a problem with is what's happening with corporate Buddhism and with secular Buddhism and with neuro Buddhism in particular is that Buddhism is being reduced to things that uh, you know are sort of dominant in the West already, namely uh, capitalism and the uh, mechanistic mat uh, materialism of, of science. So. Uh, you know, Buddhists believe that everybody is a Buddha. They just haven't figured it out yet. Everybody has Buddha nature, that it says. And so, um, and what I argue in the book is that uh, we, uh, the West started figuring that out uh, around the time of the Romanticism, basically. I mean, there be, may be a, a few figures that you could point to earlier than that. But uh, art became a kind of uh, what I call the, uh, what M.H. Abrams called uh, the, reli the religion of the poets. And the similarities between the religion of the poets, especially Wordsworth, who I spend some time with in the book, um, to Buddhism, the, the similarities there are, you know, quite striking. 
you know, I think you could say that uh, Buddhism uh, w was more developed and more mature or whatever. But, um, but you know, we've always been on, the, on that path in one way or another. I mean, just think about the American transcendentalists, the Concord transcendentalists, Walt Whitman, Emerson, Thoreau. Uh, they actually knew something about Buddhism and celebrated it. Uh, but, um, you know, science and capitalism have always resisted um, any sort of uh, empowerment of that way of thinking. But it is, in the end, it's very spiritual because, so for example, we were talking about uh, met the metaphysics of freedom at the, at the beginning. You know, uh, Alice Walker, I think, comes very close to to saying it when in her little bit in the current issue, the freedom issue of Lapham's, uh, when she when she says when she says uh, that uh, it is a short story, but I'm, I'm pretty sure this is also her position that her resistance to slavery and her desire for, for freedom comes first with the voice in her head. And she calls this voice the voice of God. And uh, I, I think that uh, freedom like beauty uh, uh, or love is one of those terms that we use all the time, but it's completely metaphysical. We have no idea what these things are in themselves, right? But you can hardly say that we were human without them. That's what I would say. And Buddhism is, is, uh, is, uh, it helps us to understand that. It helps us to see ourselves as, Buddhism helps us to see ourselves as always already spiritual and metaphysical. Thank you. Thank you for that, that answer. And another question for both of you that has come in, and it, this one is uh, slightly more back to the American side of things, but it, it comes from an attorney who says that in law school, we distinguished between the ideas of freedom from something, such as freedom from crime or from oppression, and freedom to something, such as freedom to peacefully assemble or to worship, etc. What do you think about this framework? Lewis? Well, uh... Uh, that's useful, but it, it, I don't think it gets you very far because the, the, uh, in the American scheme of things, you have freedom to do things, but only if you can pay for it. I mean, we don't have, I mean, most people in, in, in America don't really have it economic freedom and if you don't have economic freedom uh you you don't have freedom it, yeah economic so, power is what it comes down to yeah so i think that's what carlin means by american unfreedom we pretend it's freedom but that's orwell right i mean Freedom is slavery, ignorance is strength, and so on. I mean, <laughs> I remember George W. George W. Bush, the, the younger, actually said that uh, he considered his ignorance his virtue. <laughs> I mean, I think he was a more destructive President Bush than than uh, than Trump or even Biden um, almost as bad as Woodrow Wilson <laughs> I, the uh, what is self-determination of nations I mean that doesn't that doesn't work. Freedom yes. from, I mean, was, I don't think there is any such thing as freedom. Everybody's exposed to everything at all times. I mean, I, I don't, protect me from whom, from what? 
I mean, again, the Americans uh, are a little bit paranoid. They keep thinking of, of evil coming to them uh, <clears throat> as something alien, right? I mean, the uh, foreigners, immigrants, storms, climate change. Americans are always the innocent victims of uh, events over which they have no control. You don't have any control over the weather. We don't have any, the whole idea that we could uh, conquer human nature, that we could, you know, that we could uh, plunder the earth and that there was no price to be paid. The, the, you know, the oil business, the, the, the uh, all of it. I mean, the idea of nature as a storehouse of vendable wonders, that's what Jonathan Edwards called it. It was there to be uh, ravaged. Vendable? Vendable. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, that's Jonathan Edwards. Yeah. I mean, this country was not founded on as a democracy, it was founded on a dream of riches. Just the same way Rockefeller's Standard Oil and Zuckerberg's uh, Facebook to, you know, buy for, of, by, and for the desire to acquire and accumulate wealth. That was what the Puritans were about. And they developed what they call righteous friendship with mammon. To do well by doing good. So we've had that idea from the beginning. I mean, we, we are, uh, <laughs> you know, that gets you back to Aristotle, um, the, the, the uh, I mean, even the, the Constitution is, is not, it's, it's meant to set up a safe place for wealth and the wealthy. That's, that's it's not like Magna Carta. It's, it's not about the sharing of a bountiful wilderness. It's about setting up a division of the spoils by rich people setting up a government hosp hospitable to acquiring riches. You know, a theme uh -huh. of this, sorry, Lewis, I wanted to jump in with another question that's related. A theme that is coming up is this American idea of money as a virtue and how the government or politicians um, are probably, if it's a participatory oligarchy or plutocracy, probably hopeless to look to in, ter in terms of leadership. Yet at the same time, we have so many questions coming in from the audience about how the flip side of freedom is responsibility, and we don't really talk about that in America. And I want to take a second and tie this back again to um, George Carlin, and then a conversation that we were having with Curtis right before we went live. Carlin became a, a bit, he was accused of becoming nihilistic um, toward the end of, of watching humanity go down the drain. And we were talking about if we do have a responsibility to, um, to freedom, or what would be the appropriate level of responsibility to tether us to the human experience so that we're not like uh, don't quite take the, the approach of um, watching humanity go down the drain. But the responsibility is to each other. It's, it, it's not to the state. I mean, look, look, look what happens. Look at 9-11. Uh, the government doesn't show up. The American government's got no uh wish to protect the american people at all it doesn't give a goddamn about the american people who showed up were volunteers driving all the way from 
Chicago and Boston out of, you know, coming of their own free will uh, to help their fellow citizens, their fellow man. I mean, that's the felt responsibility. Mm -hmm. It's not a responsibility to, to you know, an English department. <laughs> I would say that re responsibility uh, comes not from any sort of uh, legalities. It comes from it comes from a, a sense of uh, of virtues. Finally, you know, and those virtues, like the, the it's virtuous of those of those police and fire and EM emergency management people to come all the way from Chicago, but why did they do it? And it's it's because they had an allegiance first to a sense of, of virtue. And yeah. uh, the question then becomes, well, where do we, where do, how do we know what these virtues are? And uh, I think that's where spirit comes in. It certainly is where Buddhism comes in. Uh, you know, it says, it says that it's, it's your true nature. I, I, yeah, I, I agree your, with it. Right. Yeah. It's your true, it's who you really are. So act yeah. in the way that, that uh, rather than behaving in a way that you think is in your self-interest and that it finally ends up being destructive, act in the way that is compatible with who you really are, a Buddha. But that's, I, I, I believe that true. Um, I, not in terms of Buddhism, but that's, uh, it's emotion. Right. It, it, it's not uh, thought. The enlightenment is thought. Yeah. And, 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 and the, the enlightenment, yeah. I mean, romanticism is an objection to the enlightenment, to the objection to the idea that everything is rational, economic man, uh, so forth and so on. I mean, that's, that's Wordsworth. Getting and spending, we lay waste our powers, and, and we, 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 we do. But the natural instinct is, is, is uh, emotional. Right. You know, it's the Buddha within. Right. On that note, on that note, I would say that we are, have run out of time for the conversation today. And thank you both so much. Thank you, Lewis, and thank you, Curtis, for joining us. And thank you also for everyone who participated and the excellent questions that we were not able to get to. Sorry. Well, thank you, Soraya. Thank you very much. Peace. Thank you too, Curtis. Love you, brother I, Lewis. I love you too. You're a wonder to behold. Thank, thank God. Right. Anyway. Yeah. Okay. Thanks Take care. again. Thank you. And thank you, Soraya. You were great. Nice Thanks. to meet you.